I'd like to welcome everybody to our session, to our Barracuda WAF, Scalable Security for Applications on AWS. At this time, we'll go ahead and turn the call over to Nick Matthews. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Nick Matthews from AWS. I'm a uh, partner citizen architect, and I, I work with Barracuda. So today, we're going to go over the Barracuda solution and take a look at, uh, we'll start off a little bit on AWS security. Uh, we have uh, some folks in Barracuda with us, and uh, we'll go over what the product looks like and um, and how it secures workloads in AWS. And there's the agenda. So, uh, you know, it's not any big news to anybody that security is a, a big deal these days. Uh, we're starting to see uh, a big shift in security the last few years. You know, uh, back 10 years ago, it was, it was mostly about, you know, uh, some hackers and some script kiddies that would go and deface a website to kind of prove how cool they were. Um, that's that's shifted a lot, especially in the last few years where we found out that a lot of these um, other com countries and uh, people have found out they can make a business uh, by hacking people either through extortion, uh, you know, DDoS. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, governments and other competitive companies have found out that they can steal your data. Uh, so if you've got data in your data center or wherever it might be, uh, that data is worth something and uh, they can extract value from it, either by stealing it or selling it, uh, whatnot. So most companies uh, are having a hard time with this new type of security threat. Uh, people that weren't historically targeted before or um, have a lot more uh, types of threat actors and, and threats coming at them. As, as you can all kind of appreciate, nothing is getting simpler in our lives these days. Everything's getting more complex. And with complexity, it become, you know, makes things less secure. So as things get more complex and more valuable, uh, we see a lot more security problems. So uh, part of that is how do we secure our data and, and web workloads? Uh, AWS, uh, you know, the, the CIO of Capital One got on the stage at reInvent. So I don't know how you guys will be in Vegas in a few weeks, but almost a year ago, uh, the CIO of Capital One said that he can, they can operate more securely in AWS than they can in their own data centers. Uh, and that was a real big booster for us uh, and our customers, you know, with the belief that they can do it more securely in AWS. And we battled a long time convincing customers that the, the cloud was secure, and, uh, you know, to a large extent, we're, we're really starting to convince people that, you know, that's the case. Uh, and the question is how and why. Uh, part of the reason is, is automation. The, if you talk to our CISO, he'll say the way that we make things more secure is by getting people away from data and getting people away from changing things because people make errors. Uh, if you can automate things, if you can program things, uh, they happen predictably, they happen reliably, and if they don't, you go back and you can fix it, and, and then they should work. Uh, you know, people are threat act threat actors themselves through different types of phishing attempts, and so the more you can get people out of the equation, the, the better off you'll be. And since everything on AWS is based off an API, and everything is programmable, it's a great platform for doing security automation. As well, like I said, uh, complexity breeds insecurity. So we've simplified a lot of our services. We've abstracted away a lot of the details and a lot of the undifferentiated heavy lifting uh, around infrastructure so that uh, you only deal with what you need to to deploy your applications and your workloads. Uh, and so that simplicity uh, can get rid of a lot of the complex security vulnerabilities that may otherwise exist. Uh, on top of that, we know that security is top of mind for all of our customers is job zero for us. Uh, so we, we make sure that we develop services and we, we roll out uh, new releases that uh, security is part of every release and we don't take any, uh, we, you know, we don't negotiate when it comes to security. We always make sure things happen right. So uh, we make it, for instance, we make it easy to encrypt easily. So uh, services like RDS and S3, so our managed database and our object file storage, uh, you click a single checkbox to encrypt your data. Uh, that's that's a nice and easy way to do that. Uh, as well, when it comes to authentication and uh, authorization, we've got a strong set of tools around identity and access management uh, that give you a wide way of enforcing authentication on all of our services. Uh, and we also, again, make strong choices there. So for instance, uh, last year we released the Internet of Things service uh, the Internet of Things, I don't know if you've been paying attention to like the Mirai botnets uh, and stuff like that that went out, but part of the reason why the Internet is getting you know, multi-gigabit DDoS is because 
people have deployed cameras and set-top boxes without passwords. Uh, so when we deployed our IoT service, uh, one of the mandatory parts of our of registering into the IoT service is having an X509 certificate in TLS. Uh, so even though a lot of IoT devices may not support TLS, uh, more and more of them are because we're finding out that you can't mess around with security in those kinds of ways. And so I think these all kind of add up to create a very secure environment on AWS. This is an important slide. Uh, for us, it, it's kind of gone back and forth, right? So the high level of this is that we, we take security of the cloud. Like I said, we abstract away a lot of the details, um, you know, particularly at the hypervisor layer and lower, uh, as, and at the physical data center layer. So, you know, we take care from the concrete all the way up to the hypervisor. Uh, so, you know, we secure our data centers, we secure the power, we secure the computing, uh, we secure physical access to the hard drives. We secure the network and the firewalls for the, you know, internet edge. And so then you as a customer uh, can deploy your applications on our infrastructure. And so we take, we would say we take security of the cloud. Uh, the customer is now responsible for security on the cloud. So the things that you put inside uh, of our cloud are, are your responsibility. So, for instance, if uh, you can build PCI compliant applications on AWS, but just because you build your application on AWS doesn't necessarily make it PCI compliant because uh, we can't prevent you from doing things that would break PCI compliancy because, again, it's your application and your customer data. And so that, we've, like I said, we've gone back and forth this because we took a, it took us a long time to convince customers that what we did underneath the hypervisor was secure. Uh, we're there. Customers understand that. And now, actually, sometimes we have to tell customers, like, hey, just because you put it on us doesn't make sure it's it's not actually secure. You still need to secure your own workloads. Uh, if you're worried about OWASP top 10 and other web vulnerabilities, that's still on your side of the responsibility model. And so that's where uh, Barracuda's products come in. Because you can see in this uh, top portion, network security is, is firmly in the customer's part of shared security model. So like I said, WAF, web proxies, uh, identity and user management, all those kinds of things are still going to be uh, customer responsibilities, and that's where Barracuda brings their power to bear. Uh, another way that AWS is secure is, you know, the, the monitoring that we do. So, one, not only do we do our physical monitoring of our data centers and uh, our infrastructure, and we're you know, very highly aware of any type of security, uh, you know, concerns of the infrastructure itself, uh, but you as the customer also have a lot of visibility. So, you know, CloudTrail is, is the way that you can view every API call uh, that has gone to AWS. So if changes are happening in your environment, you can get visibility of those. Uh, we've also started releasing security services like AWS Inspector. Uh, the Inspector service is a point-in-time check that can do like CIS checks to see if you have any vulnerabilities in your installed applications uh, and operating system. You know, check for uh, good authentication methods. Uh, if your you know uh, Apache version has any known CVEs, those kinds of things. So it gives you a point-in-time check of your security. So that's uh, that's good for just the basic security of your operating system and application. Uh, as well, uh, security comes in the, in the way of availability. So we we've, we operate the, the world's largest infrastructure for uh, for cloud. Uh, that means we've got 38 availability zones. So an availability zone is one or more data centers, often more than one data center, in 14 regions around the world. So we just released Ohio, and we've got a few more coming up as well in China and India and the UK, actually. Uh, another very important component of this is that when you put data in one of our regions, so our region is a geographic area, so for instance, Virginia or California or Frankfurt, Germany, right, the, the data stays in that data center. We do not take it out of that data center of that region unless you explicitly tell us to. So if you're working with EU compliance and you need to keep all your data in Germany, it stays in Germany. Same thing if you're in Virginia, you want your, all your data to stay in Virginia, it stays in Virginia. Uh, and this uh, high, this immense amount of infrastructure that we have also helps us with uh, types of security concerns like DDoS. So uh, our CloudFront service, which is our uh, content delivery network, as well as our tools like auto-scaling and uh, Route 53 allow us to, to block a lot of DDoS attacks. 
as well. Uh, customers are, as customers move to AWS and move to the cloud in general, a lot of times they're doing kind of a piecemeal migration, or they might find some easier applications to start with. They might start with their uh, business intelligence or their big data tools, or maybe uh, their new web applications or retail front end. Uh, but a lot of their existing core infrastructure stays on premise, and we can facilitate that uh, completely. Especially with you know, if you're using something like Barracuda on premises and you want to extend your uh, resources out into AWS. Using the same partner like Barracuda there makes that very easy to do. Uh, so we've got a couple tools that, to help out there. So uh, you know we've got Active Directory services and SAML tie-ins, so you can use same authentication. Uh, we've got uh, the AWS Direct Connect, which is a way to connect your existing WAN infrastructure, uh, or to connect back just a direct fiber back to your own uh, data centers, uh, as well as if you want to do things like uh, key encryption or use your existing uh, hardware security model for uh, key encryption, you can do all that and, and keep that with AWS as well. I, in terms of, I mentioned before, we have a PCI and a number of other certifications. So whether you're in the federal space and you're concerned about things like FedRAMP or uh, ITAR or those kinds of things, we, you know, GovCloud is a uh, popular destination for those types of workloads. Otherwise, we have uh, a lot of the industry standards like ISO 27001, uh, PCI DSS level three, uh, SOC one, SOC two, SOC three, um, and we've got a pretty wide array of, of certifications here. Uh, one thing that's, that's worth highlighting here, uh, specifically for Barracuda, is the security competency. So uh, I'm on the partner team, and uh, I help vet the partners that we recommend to our customers. And as part of that, uh, we have a set of technical bars that uh, we expect our, our best partners to, uh, to meet so that we can recommend them widely. And so part of this is around, you know, uh, multi-AZ, multi high availability, uh, having well-defined documentation and cloud formation templates to easily deploy their solution, uh, being able to auto-scale out uh, so that if you're using this as a you know, web application firewall, if your web application scales out, this will scale out with it. Um, and so Barracuda was one of the, the first partners to, to meet this uh, requirement. So it's, it's worth pointing out that uh, they've done a very good job uh, partnering with us uh, from a technology perspective. And with that, it's a good time to introduce Amy from Barracuda. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Nick. Awesome. Okay, well, I'll get started. So my name is Amy Bray, and I'm grateful to be here today. So Nick just highlighted Barracuda's AWS competencies and how we're a strong partner, and I want to quickly um, highlight how we got there. So our goal, our mission, is to simplify IT for companies. So that sounds really broad, but we really take this seriously, and we've been doing it around the world for over 10 years. So the reason we've been successful is because we are a customer-centric company. We really, really are laser-focused on making sure that we're solving problems for our customers. So to give you an example, when we were founded in 2003, we were originally making physical appliances, but we saw that there was potential and customer interest with virtualization. So we decided to build solutions for hypervisors. And then to take it even farther over the last few years, we've seen that the cloud can offer our customers a tremendous value so we made the effort to take a leadership role there and, uh, and create cloud-based security solutions. So it's our laser focus on innovation that really resonates with our customers as you know, we continue to, to try and raise the bar in terms of cloud uh, security for the cloud era. So I want to highlight how Barracuda Solutions are really leveraging the AWS features. So, so Nick sort of highlighted a few of these I want to draw attention to a few others. So, for example, CloudFormation templates. This is a service that really streamlines the configuration and deployment of solutions. And for a Barracuda WAF, using the CloudFormation template, um, it, it will deploy, it will bootstrap for the configuration, deploy, and, and integrate with AWS to enable auto-scaling. So that's super valuable for our customers. Another service is CloudWatch. So the integration there really enables event or schedule-based auto-scaling, 
and provides the administrator with additional monitoring capabilities. We also have full support for AWS Elastic Load Balancing, which can ensure that the back-end servers are able to scale independently. And then, of course, all of our solutions are commerce-enabled through the AWS Marketplace with, um, you know, different licensing options like bring your own license and also pay as you go. So making sure that we're offering things that are easy for customers to, to consume. So I want to highlight some of our differentiators, but I like to do this from a customer perspective. So, you know, I really want to, it's important to us to understand what our customers are asking us for. So the first thing that they're always asking us for is flexibility. We know that not everyone is starting from scratch in the cloud. So some folks are doing hybrid deployments where they've got some, um, some resources on-prem and some in the cloud. So being able to deploy um, with flexibility is something that's important to them, and that's something that we can do. Nick highlighted that. We can you know, deploy solutions that are available on-prem and in cloud and, and talk to each other with the same common uh, UI. The second piece is, a, is around being fast. You know, our customers are moving at the speed of light, so it's important that they have solutions that are really easy to use and simple to set up. The third, sort of the next piece of being fast, is around innovation. So it's important to have security, but not at the expense of performance. So we're focusing on uh, providing solutions that enhance availability and optimizing their applications. Because we know that customers don't have time to learn new products, so common user interface and the ease of use are really coming in handy with companies that are innovating. And the fourth piece around support, you know, Barracuda is sort of famous for our fanatical support. No phone trees is our mantra. So this is really appreciated not just by our customers, but by our partners. You know, we're behind them and, and we're here to make sure that they're successful. So Nick talked a little bit about the shared security model, and I want to explain, you know, the, the customer's responsibility, the security of things that are sort of above the line, or um, the, the workloads or applications that are getting deployed on the AWS infrastructure. So, you know, at Barracuda, we're, we're focused on network security and application security for, for AWS. Today, we're talking more specifically about the Barracuda Web Application Firewall, or WAF, and that's really addressing the application security piece. So it's really important that applications have constant protection from evolving threats. You know, stuff is happening all the time, so it's important that applications are, are being blocked from security threats like the OWASP top 10, DDoS attacks, and also granular identity and access management is very important. Uh, the Barracuda WAF offers pre-built and custom security templates and also detailed logs. And, and this gives um, clear visibility into the user activity. So this is something that's really important in, in terms of application security. With application security, it's, this is a topic that literally comes up in every single conversation with customers that we have about public cloud. So, so we, fi we find when we talk to customers that as they're getting ready to transition to a virtual infrastructure or um, a, a public infrastructure like AWS, the concerns around application security are really coming up. So I wanted to talk, talk here about what our customers are telling us are some of the most common steps that they've identified as they're getting ready to make this transition. So I'm calling this sort of five steps to infrastructure readiness. It's about, it's about making sure that the groundwork is laid to have a successful transition or, or to start from scratch and build successfully um, in an AWS environment. So these five steps, you know, we've got preparation, strategy, the qualification, the security, and then the final piece is the actual move or the build. And these steps don't always happen sequentially. They don't have to happen in this order necessarily. But we do find from our customers that when they are going through these steps, the transition is much more successful. And, and it really enables the, the initial migration and then uh, future, uh, future migrations. So I'm going to go into more specifics on each of those steps here. So the first is preparation. 
So, you know, we know that utilizing the cloud has tons of value, but it, it's really important from a customer's perspective that, that they understand sort of what the status of their infrastructure is today. So, you know, so they're asking how many VMs are they using, um, you know, asking themselves, do you have web-facing applications or workloads that you would transition? And are you planning on developing new sort of in the cloud applications? And what's the time frame around this? In terms of strategy, you know, we know that customers are seeing so many benefits from the public cloud. You know, the primary ones around agility, but also scalability, flexibility, cost savings. So in order to really take advantage of these things, a, a deeper strategy for how how folks are going to move to the cloud and deploy in the public cloud, it, it's really a key piece to being successful. So we're finding that most of our customers are, are actually moving web-facing applications first. And the reason we see here is that there's less impact on end users. So is this what you're planning to do? Another, another important thing to, to think about is what kind of security measures do you have in place when, um, when these applications were hosted on-premises? And do you want to replicate that same security posture in a cloud environment? Another piece is, you know, making sure that if you are to, to replicate or duplicate that security posture, you know, do you have the right resources or tools in place? So that moves into sort of the qualification piece. So, you know, have you selected a security option? Have you, um, have you asked if these solutions are cloud ready? So it's really important as customers are thinking about moving to a cloud infrastructure that they're using solutions that will support things like automation in the deployment. Will the, will the security solution dynamically scale up and down with your workloads? And have you done a proof of concept? The proof of concept is an important piece because it can provide the framework architecture. And, and once you've got that, you can start to migrate additional workloads. And then on the security side of things, you know, it, it sounds redundant to say, but once you've really chosen your framework architecture, you need to deploy it before you actually start migrating workloads. So, you know, for example, if you're a healthcare company that's going to be moving patient records, or an e-commerce business that's going to be moving workloads with credit card numbers or other proprietary information, you want to make sure that the solution can help you stay HIPAA compliant, you know, PCI compliant, and, and you really need that security for the application layer. So, so that, that aspect of the security step is important. And then the last thing on the security side is, is making sure that you've got a security solution that, that can be available, for example, with pay-as-you-go or, or different licensing options that, uh, from a customer's perspective, gives them that flexibility and allows them to sort of see the biggest ROI as they're deploying. And then the last step, once you've sort of checked the boxes on these other things and you've laid the groundwork for a successful migration, then, then the work can actually start happening. So this is when we find that our customers have the most successful migrations um, to a cloud. Once the proof of concept's out of the way, they're able to migrate sort of their first workload and, and see how things work. And we find that customers are deploying, um, you know, maybe a, a test workload or a dev workload just to see how things are going. And once the migration is really straightforward and everything's performing as expected and everything is secure, then customers are starting to move more and more. And this is where you start to see the tremendous agility and cost savings that, uh, that a public cloud infrastructure um, can offer. So this is really where we see sort of, we call it like a, a land and expand, right? So you might put a few workloads in, an, in a public cloud infrastructure like AWS. Once you've got the thumbs up, everything is secure, then it really opens the doors. And this is when we see tremendous um, opportunity to leverage the, the benefits of AWS. So with that, we want to tell, you know, a, a much more specific customer example. And my colleague Rich Turner is going to walk you through um, the customer example for Iris Solutions and, and how they went through these five steps. They were able to build their business on AWS and secure it with Barracuda. So I'll hand it over to Rich at this point. 
Well, thanks, Amy, and thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, I'm at also a product marketing manager at Barracuda, and what I want to talk about today is a customer of ours called Iris Solutions up in the Toronto area, and the business they're in, how it evolved, and how AWS has become a key part of that. First, let me give you a little background about who Iris Solutions is. And they actually have two different products. The product on the right was their first product, which was ITS Hub. Um, and in Canada, it's a little different than the United States. There are a number of cell phone retailers who do their own provisioning, their own billing, their own collections, um, and they just uh, acquire services from the uh, telecom providers. So Iris Solutions built this solution called ITS Hub, very integrative, very innovative, excuse me. One piece that they had to create themselves was an automated e-signature solution that tied in with credit cards and credit checks. Um, also, they're in the Canadian market, so you know there are pretty substantial regulations about any of this. They found, as they developed this e-signature product, that it opened up a whole other market to them, and that's the product on the left called Iris Autograph which is now their most significant product. And it's a very secure electronic signature solution. It has to conform to um, CAPITA, to UTEA, to all the e-sign laws, and all of the Canadian laws, as well as American laws, because they actually have customers in both countries. And interestingly, with Autograph, their customers started out as financial institutions, but then they suddenly became very popular with commodity traders. They broke into the capital markets. So Autograph has become really the significant portion of Iris, but it's interesting that it came out of the ITS hub. When we look at Autograph, the cloud is key. Um, basically, it relies on cloud processor, both processing and integration. And for Autograph, they have to both combine this authentication and add a layer of encryption in Iris Seal. And earlier, um, Nick mentioned that, that encryption is something that's very simple in AWS. This was, again, a very key component for them. And on the left is actually the diagram of how they process Iris autograph requests. But it doesn't stop there because the cloud is also central to Iris ITS. The telecom solution, the hub is the key to bridging all of these retailers and these telecom providers. And it has a lot of the same challenges as Autograph. Basically, there could be millions of transactions. They have to be supported across a rel relatively short burst. In other words, in both of these businesses, it's really impossible to go in and identify and normalize your traffic. It's going to come as it comes. Um, and if you're going to be successful in this market, traffic can't be um, a barrier. Also, security is a big piece of this. <clears throat> Not just data integrity and cloud security, but remember, they are dealing now with financial institutions, brokerage houses, and the regulations go beyond a lot of basic security solutions. More important, customers needed reassurance that Irish had security measures in place. So this is the market they were facing. And Iris was already familiar with AWS. They would used it for some DevOps features, but they decided that instead of expanding their own on-premises data centers, they would deploy the uh, Autograph product entirely in AWS, and they would also do the same with ITS Hub. So having realized what they wanted to do, they were going to move their data centers, they also had a pretty good strategy. And they had a series of challenges that they needed to address. I mean, that they fall into buckets of flexibility, resiliency, and ease of management. But if you dive a little deeper, they needed scalability as well. They had to be able to handle all of these transactions whenever they came through. Um, they wanted AWS to serve as a hub for both business ends. And in, sense, in essence, they wanted to be able to use utilize Iris Autograph, both as a self-standing product, as an integral part of the ITS hub. 
Now, these were all web-facing solutions. They realized that if they wanted to go to AWS and use AWS as their data center, this had to be very resilient to attacks and threats. Um, another piece that I really didn't even put on this, but we, it's worth talking about, they also needed a very solid audit trail for everything that happened, for all the traffic that came in, that came out, not just that transactions were processed, transactions were submitted, but also if there were any attacks that they were caught, that they were mitigated, and more important, that data didn't leave the ITS solutions. Because remember, both you know, Autograph in particular, but ITS Hub as well, has valuable customer information. They needed to make sure that they weren't having data loss issues. And this is a quote from Sergey Rodovinsky. Unfortunately, he couldn't be on today's webinar because of some scheduling issues. But he sort of summed it up in a single breath, that when they looked at the strategy, they came up with the methodology, they saw gaps in some of their departments. This was the qualification phase for IRIS solutions. They were already familiar with AWS. They did look at other cloud providers. They chose to stick with AWS. They felt the platform was more robust and more mature. But they also saw that they needed to supplement and augment their security. They looked at several different solutions, but they found exactly what they wanted in Barracuda. They did a small qualification, a proof of concept. It was fairly quick. It proved that the Barracuda solution could do what they wanted, and then they decided to go ahead and implement. And as I said, they have no on-premise data center. It is entirely done. The Barracuda WAF and the AWS marketplace provided a number of things, but these five pieces became critical for them. First of all, I mentioned it earlier, two-way protection. They needed to know that they would both have protection against incoming attacks and outgoing data loss. Again, security is key to them. But also along with that is the ability to have this strong authentication and control center that they could restrict access to particularly sensitive applications. Of course, they needed to block DDoS attempts, OWASP top 10, other attacks. They needed a scalable and very elastic environment. And they also wanted simple provisioning. They found all of this in the WAF and in AWS. And this is how Iris leveraged Barracuda. First of all, they went to the AWS marketplace. They acquired and provisioned the Barracuda WAF. They did a small proof of concept. It worked. They deployed the WAF in an auto-scaling group so they could handle large numbers of transactions. And they also utilized pay-as-you-go licensing because that would hedge them against these traffic bursts. The benefit included two-way protection for these highly sensitive customers. And finally, they were able to use the AWS cloud as their central hub for both of these web-facing products. Like I said, they have no data centers on premises today. What did they gain from this? Actually, they benefited greatly. And Iris Solutions is growing. Like I said, they have customers in Canada and now customers in the US. They fully leveraged the AWS cloud as their only hub. They got all the protection they wanted against external attacks and prevented data loss. They solved the issues of scale and the burst requirements with a combination of auto-scaling, of uh, CloudWatch, which of course would kick in the auto-scaling automatically. They didn't have to follow it. And finally, of course, they had data loss protection. And they had the ability to use pay-as-you-go licensing. Sorry. They also had tangible proof, because sensitive customers wanted to know, all right, have you enhanced the security? What's going on? We need to look at a log. Such and such attack occurred. Did it affect you? They got all of this proof. And they were able to support their ongoing expansion without a lot of additional capital costs. That was really the key for Iris Solutions, that they wanted to be able to scale. They wanted a very flexible solution, and they really didn't want or weren't able to do the type of capital expenditures they need to build this entire thing themselves. So that's what we want to talk about, about IRIS solutions. Um, and at this point, we'd like to open it up to questions and answers. And I'm sure this group probably has many. And I'll turn it back to our host. And we will start our Q&A here. I wanted to first point out we do have our polls at the bottom of the screen, one at the top. 
We also have our Q&A panel now on the left side of your screen where you can still ask your questions for the session. We also have a web links pod up there where you can just click on the check out the Barracuda in the AWS Marketplace, and that'll take you to a nice place you can bookmark. And at this point, we'll go ahead and turn it over to our Q&A. Cool. All right. All right, guys. Well, if you guys have some questions, uh, there's a Q&A panel. Start throwing some questions in there. Uh, otherwise, I think we'll go ahead and go through some of the ones that we've got. Let's see here. Uh, one of the ones that came up was, what is the difference between a WAF and a next-gen firewall? Would one of you guys from Barracuda like to carry that? Sure. Uh, so typically, uh, I would say that they're complementary uh, devices. So. You know, when you think of a next generation firewall, you're thinking layer seven protection, but that's actually layer seven protection of your customers or employees from the internet, right? You're looking at YouTube and Facebook, uh, things of that nature. When you're talking about WAF, we're talking about layer seven protection to your servers. So that's significantly different. So uh, they, they're complementary products in the sense that the next generation firewall will do the IDS and the IPS protection. But it's not going to be able to decrypt the payload, validate that the payload is good, and either re-encrypt or SSL offload to the backend server. So that's where typically you would have a next generation firewall and a WAF uh, complementing uh, that idea of security with defense and depth. OK, cool. Thanks. Uh, there was another question uh, that came up. I mean, if you could just differentiate real quick between the AWS WAF and the Barracuda WAF. Yeah. So, um, and I'm not trying to knock the AWS WAF. It's just um, it's it's mu a much more recent product. Uh, Barracuda WAF has been around for about 15 plus years. It was actually an acquisition of a startup called NetContinue about 10 years ago. And NetContinue had been around for a, a number of years before that, but um, you know uh, the the best thing I can tell you is is that it's really uh, an easy product to deploy. Uh, we 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 really tried to simplify it. When you know our first WAF came out, it was just super technical. Uh, application security tends to be a very niche market. People wouldn't understand whether they needed to allow traffic or block traffic. And we, we feel that over the number of years, we've really simplified and made it very easy to use. And then in addition to your typical OWASP top 10 protection, you know, we do things like JSON security, XML firewall. Uh, we can proxy authentication. Uh, we can also, from a SSL, TLS uh, level, we can say which ciphers are allowed. So we can be extremely granular. Uh, we have the ability to do content routing. So if you got one IP address, multiple sites, we can do host header routing to uh, different backend servers or different ELBs based on the actual host header. So uh, you know, just from a maturity standpoint, uh, we'll give you all that protection and more. Uh, the AWS WAF uh, currently requires CloudFront. Uh, I believe you are charged at a pro rule basis, so it's efficient from that standpoint. Uh, the the issue I think that most people will have initially is that you're actually going to be creating those rules yourself. Um, the default policy of the Barracuda WAF tends to satisfy, satisfy most of our customers just uh, straight out of the box. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, and then there was. Um there was a question. Um, they want to see some screenshots, which I don't think we can do in, in this setting. So I think the uh, the slide deck well, is next. Well, what you what you can do though is uh, we actually provide UI access to all our products. So if you go to waf.barracuda.com, uh, there's a login screen for guests. Just click login, and you can walk through the whole interface. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, because that has some questions about the basic and common filters. So I'm going to guess that some of the OWASP 10 stuff, as well as probably just basic SQL injection protection. Exactly. It's going to be all the OWASP top 10. So that's really what a WAF is, is basically it's going to be OWASP top 10 protection. So 
SQL injection, cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, things of that nature, and it's, and it's a whole lot more you'll find out. Okay. And there was a question here. Um, can you protect API services with the Barracuda WAF? So um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, there is JSON protection. So the, the one thing I don't want you to think is, is is a replacement of an API gateway, so to speak. So while we will give you protection on validation of keys and sizes and, and uh, validation of the actual fields as it being a string or a numeric, things of that nature, uh, we're not going to do transformations or translations that an API gateway would do. But we will give you basic security if you are running an API on the back end. OK, cool. Uh, and this says, what is the data loss protection aspect of the Barracuda WAF? Are you referring to data loss as attack or hardware failure? Uh, I think we're probably talking about uh, responses from the back end server. So we have the ability to do what we call data theft protection. So if you're doing credit cards or social security numbers, we've already got patterns built in where we can mask them. Or if you just want to block that page completely, you can do that. We also have the ability to create custom patterns. So let's say you have patient ID numbers or there's a certain pattern that you don't want necessarily being revealed by the, the back end server. Uh, we have the ability to cloak or, or block those. OK, cool. Uh, let's see here. Someone was asked, uh, are there other products from Barracuda on the marketplace? Uh, yes, for AWS in particular, you, you've got the, uh, the, the web application firewall, the next generation firewall, our email security gateway, and our application delivery controller. OK. Uh, looks like we also have sure, go ahead. products in AWS as well. OK. Uh, looks like there was a comment here that says you can also use the Barracuda WAF to fix busted apps. So that's a, that's a fun one. Um, let's see here. So someone asked, did, did Iris do a proof of concept? Uh, what did that look like? Uh, yes, they did do a proof of concept. Uh, they ran this themselves. Um, they provisioned it directly from AWS and set it up. And they uh, defined a virtual um, private computer. They associated it with a specific subnet. And then they ran one of their applications through it uh, to determine that the WAF you know, basically would provide them the uh, requested filters and the um, front-end capability. Um, their proof of concept was considerably less than 30 days. Um, but again, cool. Iris had a very, very good idea of what they wanted to do and um, the type of uh, data center that they wanted to stand up. But yes, they did a short proof of concept. And uh, I should point out that, that um, there's a 30-day free trial for Barracuda products. So um, all they had to worry about was any time they spent with uh, AWS. OK. Uh, here's another question. Does Barracuda WAF provide any static content caching functionality? So we do have a, um, a caching proxy on the box itself. But it's not what I would call something like a blue coat, where you're you know, caching large video files and things of that nature. But if you have websites with GIFs and JPEGs, uh, and you want to um, streamline so that it doesn't have to always go to the back end server for those, um, for those images, uh, we do have basic caching as well as compression on the WAF. Uh, it looks like there's another question here. Does the WAF require installing agents on AMIs? Uh, no agent is, is necessary. OK. Yeah, so that's just an inline proxy then? That's correct. So you're basically just going to filter. It's a, a reverse proxy. So basically, uh, the easiest way I, I try to tell people, because most people are, are more familiar with network security, is it's kind of like a matting device. We're going to have an IP on our device, and we're going to map to a back end load balancer or server. And essentially, we're man in the middle. So when a browser connects to us, we act like the server. And then when we validate that the traffic is good, we act like the client 
to the actual server. That looks like all the questions we've got today. Thanks for joining in today. At this time, you can disconnect.